And welcome back to our studio today, everybody. Today, we are going to welcome Mike Benz into our program. You can follow Mike on X uh, at, at Mike Benz Cyber. Also, uh, Foundation for Freedom Online.com. He is the founder of Foundation for Freedom Online. It's a free speech watchdog dedicated to restoring the promise of free and open internet. He is a former State Department cyber official at the Trump administration, and he's going to tell us about what he has learned from that. He is author of what on Twitter says, The Unpublishable Monstrosity, Weapons of Mass Deletion. So he's going to blow your mind today. We'll uh, Hopefully Susan will be okay and able to sleep tonight after we have a conversation with Mike Benz after this. Our laws, as it pertain to substances, are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell do you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Let's talk about aging because everyone wants to know how to slow it down. For almost a decade, I've been taking a healthy aging supplement called True Niagen. This supplement boosts NAD. That's something that cells can't live without. It's done with a patented form of nicotinamide riboside called NR or Niagen. It's more efficient and more scientifically reviewed than NMN or other NAD boosters. True Niagen is truly the best way to boost NAD levels. And it's made by Chromadex. They're the gold standard in the NAD space. Dr. Charles Brenner, the scientist who discovered the NAD-boosting potential of NR, explains. And the center of the metabolism that allows the conversion of food into energy is NAD coenzymes. And NAD gets disturbed um, in the aging process. And as we're exposed to conditions of metabolic stress, mm. niagen, which is the... Um, form of, of NR that was developed by Chromadex is the, is the best and the only fully legal form of NR. And this is really the gold standard for NAD boosting uh, vitamins. I love this product. I urge you to try it. Go to drdrew.com slash trueniagen for 20% off your order. That is drdrew.com slash trueniagen, T-R-U-N-I-A-G-E-N, and enter Dr. Drew at checkout, D-R-D-R-E-W, and are in the checkout for 20% off. You asked for it, and the wellness company has delivered. The medical emergency kit, replete with ivermectin, prescription antibiotics, and more, continues to fly off the shelves. We keep one here at home. And there are three new kits you need to know about, and more are coming. The Contagion emergency kit was inspired by the high demand for the medical kits. In that Contagion kit, you'll find ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, antibiotics, budesonide, and a nebulizer. And a must for your next trip is the travel emergency kit, something I made sure exactly what I give my patients is in this kit and some more. The kit includes remedies for jet lag, variety of infections, even GI ailments. Imagine your flight getting grounded anywhere, say even in the U.S., and you start getting sick. You do not want to be at the mercy of of the U.S. healthcare system or any healthcare system. At home, we keep the ultimate first aid kit on hand. It has over 20 essential supplies and medications for situations when time is of the essence. Order one for your car and your go bag. Because these kits contain prescriptions, your purchase includes a telemedicine consultation as well as an instruction manual. Go to drdrew.com slash TWC for 10% off. That is drdrew.com slash TWC for 10% off all your orders. I'm very excited about these kids. Go to drdrew.com slash TWC. Yeah, I love those guys. I love, I am so grateful for the people that support us. We have such great products. And uh, and we have new Nanlite uh, lights now in the studio. I don't know if anybody can tell, but it just looks so good. Very enthused. Thank you. And for we want to thank them there. very much. Yeah, thank, thank you for our, uh, your guys' support, for being enthusiastic supporters of this program, and for those that uh, come in here and, and uh, promote themselves. Uh, we try to, I mean, they're people I use. I mean, I, I bring the travel kit with me from Wellness Company. I take True Niagen. These are all things that we use genuinely. Dr. So. Drew approved. So, yeah. So, there you go. Uh, all right. So, more on Mike Benz. Uh, one of the things we'll be talking about today is the Supreme Court's um, case. Uh, 
that I believe Mike Benz is saying is the most important free speech versus censorship case in U.S. history called Murthy versus Missouri. It was previously called Missouri versus Biden. And uh, as you know, we've had many of the the plaintiffs in that case on this show, Jay, Jay Bhattacharya, Aaron Cariotti, people like that. And uh, boy, the fact that those guys are not uh, sufficient in and of themselves to sort of prove the case of the excesses of uh, of the cyber bullying that went on during COVID, I don't know what is. Again, Mike Benz, the founder of Foundation for Freedom Online. Uh, you can follow Mike uh, at Mike Benz Cyber and also Foundation for Freedom Online dot com. Please welcome Mike Benz. Mike, welcome to the program. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having me on. You bet. And Caleb, before I get into it, uh, is there something going on with the Twitter Spaces? I don't. It doesn't come up on my feed here. Is there? I'm, you having trouble with that out. today? I'm getting it figured out. Okay. Right yeah. Every Tech once issues. in a while, there's problems with that. So yeah. So, Mike, uh, I got a lot to talk to you about. Um, what I want to do is sort of, uh, rather than dump it all up front here, uh, I want to take people through a little bit who you are, where you learned what you learned, and who the blob is. Let's kind of start with that. Sure. So, in, in what order would you like me to tackle that? I mean, in terms well, of my sorry. personal... <laughs> Sure. Your, your personal story and how you, I mean, is this something you've always known, thought about? Is it by being inside and, this, and, and just what your training is and experience and how you got to where you are? Which, and did you have moments of, uh, you know, sort of, you know, some of listening to some of your videos gives me moments of uh, sort of uh, astonishment, frankly, or, or, or uh, you know, I guess they're moments of clarity of sorts, but go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, my background was a corporate lawyer in New York. I was uh, in the tech space. I had come from a sort of internet business family. The internet was always a really big part of my life and my career uh, in terms of law. Uh, but you know, I started writing this story about internet censorship long before I became a, a character in it. In about August 2016, I began writing this book, which is currently in its unpublished form, Weapons of Mass Deletion, uh, because I came across a series of white papers and, and, and research posted online around a technique for censoring speech online using artificial intelligence. And immediately I had flashbacks to my childhood having lived through, I was an avid chess player as a kid. I lived through that era when chess computers overtook uh, human capacities and the adults in the room were always saying this was never gonna happen. And at the time it was very evident as a kid that it was. And I came across this sort of AI, these AI censorship tools in, in late 2016. And I was chicken little, you know, going around to my friends and family saying, this is going to be the end of free speech in the Western world. This is going to be just like it was for chess computers. There's going to be no escape from it once these things are, you know, basically I, I normalized. I want to stop you. I, I don't, I don't, I don't intuitively make the connection between what happened to chess and what's happening to free speech. Help me understand that. Yeah. So... The way chess computers work are they can break down basically billions of moves per second. And at the end of the day, they spit out a number that says who's winning on the chessboard. So, you know, if, if a number says 0 0.7, that means the computer assesses the black position as being up seven tenths of a pawn. And through this ability to break down every move and to just brute force your way to being able to see the whole board, you can win against any human simply by having the computer analyze the position for you and make those moves. What was happening with speech online in 2016 is during the 2016 election, you had, it was an internet election in the same way that the Brexit referendum was very much an internet vo uh, vote. This was really the first election in the 10 years of social media. You know, you had Facebook in 2004, you had Twitter 2000, you know, YouTube 2005, Twitter 2006, smartphone 2007. It took about 10 years for ordinary citizens and citizen journalists and independent news outlets to be able to build up subscriberships that approximated that of legacy news media like the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. And by 2016, the social media started to become actually more of a dominant force for influencing hearts and minds and who they decided to vote for in an election than legacy media. Donald Trump is a great example of that. He had zero, zero print newspaper endorsements in 2016. Um, he was he was essentially blacklisted on broadcast TV. Even Fox News was highly divided about him. But according to the digital forensics reports from David Brock and, and other sort of uh, NGO affiliates, 
the the engagement for Trump on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube was something like three to four times what it was for Hillary Clinton. So it it more than offset the uh, the support in the legacy media. And so the autopsy report coming out of the 2016 election was we need to censor the internet in order to stop these populist political forces, both in the U.S. and across NATO, uh, because there was a rise of populist parties on the other side of the Atlantic as well. Uh, and, and that's sort of how we got to the present day. That sort of gets to the censorship industry part. On the censorship technology part, just to sort of wrap up that point, is they had a problem with uh, with censoring the internet after the 2016 election, which was that there was only so much you could do with humans doing the censorship. They, you know, YouTube tried tried to hire 10,000 new content moderators in January 2017. It didn't work, so they tried to hire another 10,000 in March 2017. The problem with human censorship is you can't, you need to wait until something essentially goes viral and is flagged to you before you can stop it. And so the damage, in a sense, is already done. It's what they refer to as whack a mole. But if you can use artificial intelligence to basically program a, a foreknowledge of what a network will say, if you can just hire a bunch of social scientists to map their language and to track emerging narratives, you can pre censor. Uh, political movements. You can pre-censor uh, dissent against public health policies or climate po- policies. You name it. It's basically a, a godlike tool to be able to. And the reason that I refer to it as weapons of mass deletion is because I saw these tools as being done in the digital speech uh, capacity. What was done with weapons of mass destruction in terms of how that changed warfare from World War II and onwards. You didn't need a standing army of a hundred thousand censors. You could, you could delete millions of posts with just a few lines of code. And, and this evolutionary arms race, this new Manhattan project, is what I really got sucked into in late 2016. And then trying to understand the forces behind that is what took me into my mapping of the censorship industry. That's what took me into government and where I am today. And so the forces behind it, you characterize as the blob. So tell us about that. Susan, yeah, listen so carefully. The- so the blob is not my term. That's the term uh, from Deputy National Security Advisor Ben Rhodes uh, of the Obama administration. In uh, I think he coined this in 2014, 2015. You know, and this was this was someone from the Democrat Party. The National Security Advisor is basically the head of the intelligence community. He was the basically second in charge of that, and he was describing the Obama administration's frustration with having to deal mm. with permanent Washington. That is this this. So his moniker for the blob was was a shorthand for the foreign policy establishment. And that's a very sort of euphemistic way of describing what, what we're up against in this setting. But the foreign policy establishment is essentially that class of government agencies and donors and drafters off of government policy on, on the private sector outside that are tasked with managing the American empire, which is a which is our global set of interests as opposed to the American homeland. You know, you've got things like the Department of you know, Housing and Urban Development, the Department of Labor, the Department of Agriculture. These are all domestic facing agencies. But there are three sets of agencies in particular, the State Department, the Pentagon, and the intelligence agencies that are strictly foreign facing. The CIA is not allowed to operate domestically. The State Department is not allowed to operate domestically. The Pentagon is not allowed to operate domestically. They're all supposed to be foreign facing. And they're because of that, they're imbued with a very special set of powers uh, in order to manage our international interests. This is after, you know, after World War II, we basically deputized this trifecta of government agencies and their affiliates throughout the rest of government with a department of dirty tricks power, the power to overthrow foreign governments, the power to control foreign media, the, the power to manipulate elections. Uh, you name it. There's a whole suite of of dirty deeds that they are legally deputized to deploy that U.S. facing institutions are not. And what the story of, of internet censorship and the censorship industry is really a story of that section of our government and that section of the donors and drafters on the outside of that weaponizing that particular Department of Dirty Tricks capacity domestically because of a fear that the the internal choices of the domestic population would severely undercut a foreign policy consensus that had existed from Truman until Trump. And uh, you had gone on in one of your presentations to talk about how them characterizing or going out of their way to make a special category of terrorists within our country of white supremacists or 
wh- whatever that category is, allowed them to take some of this non-domestic focus and bring it to the homeland. Is, th- is that accurate? Well, I, I wish it were only that. I mean, that, that was part of how it started. You know, the, I mean, we can get into the deep origins of it, but certainly in the immediate origins, we, you, you could say that this started in the U.S. with Russiagate. And the idea that, you know, there was this hostile foreign nation state that had manipulated our elections. And so because of that, the CIA is tasked to take on Russia. The State Department is tasked to take on Russia. The Pentagon is tasked to take on Russia. So these all have a a special word called counterintelligence, which is a dirty little framing trick used to be able to to inverse the the foreign-facing intelligence so that it's domestic-facing. So basically, Mm. uh, the CIA is allowed to monitor U.S. citizens not in their intelligence capacity, but in a counterintelligence capacity. If they suspect that they are being used wittingly or unwittingly by Russian intelligence agencies, then U.S. agencies can be spied on. They can be wiretapped. You know, they you can have the NGO swarm funded by the State Department. You can have the civil affairs branch funded by the Pentagon all descend on U.S. citizens. And so that predicate that was laid in that transition period before Trump was inaugurated, you know, there was a January 6, 2017 CIA memo that said Russia you know, manipulated our election. And that was ratified by the 16 other intelligence agency branches. FBI counterintelligence got in on it. The State Department, DOD, they all got in on it. That was that was more about counterintelligence of, of Russian soft power projection than it was about terrorism. The terrorism portion does come into this because the, the original censorship office within the U.S. government uh, was a counterterrorism office set up in 2014 to take on ISIS recruiting on Facebook and Twitter. This was a, 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 an obscure little cell within the State Department called the, the Global Engagement Center, uh, which was you know, founded by the, the former Time Magazine editor uh, or managing editor, uh, Rick Stengel, guy who was the Undersecretary of State for Public Affairs. He described himself as Obama's propagandist in chief. That was his own uh, self-title. He, he said his role was to export the First Amendment in 2014. But then when Trump won the election in 2016, he wrote an op-ed and then a full book calling for an end to the First Amendment. So it went from exporting the First Amendment around the world to ending the First Amendment on a permanent basis because of the power of social media uh, to basically have people elect folks that that the, the State Department didn't want didn't want uh, changing is, U.S. foreign policy. Is this a... a I, I've become preoccupied with the French Revolution, people know on this show. And is this a phenomenology that just occurs in governments that they tend to go towards these bureaucratic centralized uh, I, I you know sort of overly uh well you know it, it's 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 uh fascistic or 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 um totalitarian is is there always a drift that direction and this is just the modern version of it and they just sort of drift into it by slowly eliminating rights well, it's hard to say how much of of this blob structure is cr- has been created over the past five years versus has simply been revealed uh, for, of, right. of what it's what it's been for for you know essentially a century. Which is which is to say that this foreign policy establishment, you could argue, was created in the 1910s uh, under under yeah. Woodrow Wilson, you know, with this mm-hmm. with this idea of making the world safer, democracy. And using that as a predicate to to imbue our our blob with the power to overthrow foreign governments in order to install democracies. Now, of course, they were never democracies as the uh, you know as as the kind of French Revolution <laughs> contemplated. Uh, yeah. Even even imbuing yeah. a sort of positive connotation to that, it was always a it was always an open society tactic, which is to say that we we use that predicate of democracy as a way to force other countries to open up their societies to blob control. That is, uh, open society means- So disappointing. Their, so their disappointing when you not, say it that way, <laughs> right? Well, <laughs> people need to be able to x-ray through the, the censor speak language of this all. You know, the, the predicate, the, initially when you were saying counter, you know, counterterrorism and whatnot, and my first response was, I wish it was only, we were, we were still at that stage where they were using a terrorism predicate for this. They are using today the most popular predicate for censorship is, is democracy. You know, it's it's this idea that they they've redefined democracy to mean a consensus of individuals to a consensus of institutions, which is essentially right. you know all the blob is is comprised of hundreds or thousands of of discrete institutions 
representing diplomacy, representing defense, representing intelligence, representing the Chamber of Commerce and all of the different multinational corporations, representing all the different industrial subsectors, representing the financial interests of the creditor class in Wall Street and London. And there's a very sophisticated consensus building process that goes into any whole of society mobilization, whether that be a war in Ukraine or public health response like COVID or emergency elections like, say, in 2020 and, and what will be you know, before us in 2024. And so a lot of my life from 2017 to 2019 was spending my whole day in these consensus building conferences. If you know where to look, they were doing this very openly. They were doing this on their own NATO YouTube pages. They were doing this on their own Atlanta Council YouTube pages. They were doing this in Department of, of Homeland Security live streams. They were doing this, you know, uh, there's there's a all of these stakeholders of of our foreign policy of our foreign policies the, the stakeholders on the outside have a much bigger pull than the, than the government functionaries on the inside. You don't get rich working at the CIA. You're making 100k a year as a mid level CIA analyst. You don't get rich, you know, as even at, even the highest level at the, at the State Department is only going to be up upper, you know. 185 or something, 200. You get rich for what you do afterwards. You get rich for doing favors for the private sector side of the blob. They essentially All lobby. Right. Yeah. Well, we can. Yeah. So, so I'm working my way towards, uh, you know, Missouri versus Biden. But to this point, you today put out a video about three scandals in the Biden family, right? And and when I I'll let you go through what those scandals were, and and one of the things that worried me, and it, it it just triggered again by what you just said, is that even though this seems outlandish, we all wonder why isn't why aren't they going after this? Why aren't they looking into it? My fear is that they're all doing this, and if they if except for maybe a couple of people in the house who seem very vocal, people like Jim Jordan, maybe they're not doing it, but the rest of them are, and so they'd have to come clean about their own duplicity in all this, if indeed. What you're saying is accurate. So go ahead, talk about that and these three scandals you pointed out today. Yeah, well, that's standard operating procedure for both the Yankee and cowboy sides of the blob. You know, that's sort of the the, the term that that uh, left wing researchers from the 1960s and 70s had come up with to sort of identify two main power blocks uh, representing the Democrat and Republican Party. And initially, you know, around the time of the JFK assassination, there was a lot of literature published around this trying to make sense of American power structures in the 20th century. And that was this idea that you had this sort of Yankee faction that was primarily the power base of the DNC. And these involved the financial institutions, uh, you know, Wall Street and the, the, the web of, of financial class uh, interest holders, primarily in the Northeast and London. And then you had this sort of Republican power block that they call the Cowboys, which was mostly a sort of, you know, South, uh, you know, Southern or, or Southwest stretching from Florida through Texas and up into California when at the time the military complex was was located there under Reagan, I should say before Reagan. And that was essentially the military energy and chamber of commerce corporate uh, backers of the Republican Party. And these two parties jockeyed for power in the 20th century for a senior and junior position in Washington. And both of them had this grift of foreign policy for personal profit. Uh, you know, one of the things that I just did a couple lectures on uh, in my subscriber streams on on X, it, we were watching things like the Carlisle Connection, which was the Carlisle hedge Carlisle Group hedge fund that the Bush family did to do the same sort of foreign policy for for personal profit that the Biden family did. And you know, here in this case, and and just to to break down what that grift is, is if you are in a position of power within the blob, within the foreign policy establishment, and you get to set U.S. foreign policy around the globe or in a particular region, you essentially have an insider trading capability to be able to make profitable investments on what will happen in that region because you know that the Pentagon is about to overthrow that government. You know that the CIA is about to twist the arm of a prime minister in order to get them to approve a new military base or, or to uh, open up a new shale field for extraction. If you know that the State Department is about to pass sanctions on that country in order to get make that investment happen. And so people who occupy these senior policy positions within the foreign policy blob are able to have months or years of advanced knowledge of that and deploy their own assets and do favors for their wider network accordingly. 
This is in many respects how George Soros went from a millionaire to a billionaire with, with foreign currency speculation as, as he was partnering with the U.S. government in the 1980s. This is essentially the story of what the Biden family was doing, you know, about that video that I put out and the three scandals around the Biden administration with foreign policy for personal profit. In that case, it was Ukraine, China, and Mexico. And all of these foreign policy positions of the U.S. government, and I should add, by the way, Joe Biden uh, is called, called himself Mr. Foreign Policy for the first 30 years of his, of his career. He, he is a blob cutout uh, you know, through and through. And remember, before he was Barack Obama's vice president, who had senior authority on all things Ukraine, that is, Obama delegated the Ukraine portfolio to Joe Biden from 2008 through, through 2016. But before that, what was Joe Biden doing in Washington? He wasn't uh, overseeing HUD. He was the head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. That is, that's, that is the, the, the Senate relationship with the State Department and our entire diplomacy, uh, defense, intelligence apparatus. He had spent 30 years on the Senate Foreign uh, Relations Committee and 10 years rotating between chairman and, uh, and ranking member. So, so this was somebody who was situated more than any, any other person in the U.S. government to be able to do these, uh, did these you know, in, in personal family investments in regions around the world because he was setting U.S. policy on our activity there. So the, those three scandals that I mentioned involved, so you know, the first one is one that's been widely published around Ukraine. You, know, you had the situation where Hunter Biden was making $65,000 a month sitting uh, essentially on a no-show uh, you know, board seat position in order to lobby the U.S. State Department to do to take action in in Ukraine that was favorable to Burisma. Burisma was a private gas company that uh, was a big feeder into this company called Nafta Gas, which is the public public owned uh, Ukraine company there. And what what the Bidens were trying to do were to kill Russian exports to Europe and build up Ukraine's own gas uh, industry in order to have Ukraine replace Russia. But then Ukraine would not even hold its own uh, gas interests. They would be sold off in so-called foreign direct investment to uh, to U.S. energy companies around Biden world. And so this was this was the play that was going on there with Burisma. And this is you know this involved the State Department, the CIA, and the DoD. At the time, we were providing hundreds of millions of dollars of military assistance. This is what Trump got impeached about in 2019, mind you, uh, was potentially holding up military assistance. This was three years before war even broke out there in 2022, because at the same time that Hunter Biden was profiting from Burisma, Burisma's shale rights were in the eastern region of the country, which, which had declared itself a breakaway state after the 2014 State Department coup. And so what, what Hunter Biden was, was engaged to do was to basically lobby the State Department and the Pentagon and the intelligence community to break down the doors of eastern Ukraine in order to open up this shale that would profit Burisma. And again, he's on the board of Burisma. It's the same story with the other, uh, with Nafta Gas, the, the, the public company there. You know, then there's the situation with, uh, with China. You know, Basically, the Biden administration has has reversed the uh, you know it, the Trump policies around containment of China. Currently, uh, China just just signed a four hundred billion dollar deal with Iran in order to evade U.S. sanctions on Iranian oil and gas exports. Well, who was partnered with Chinese with the with the Chinese energy world? Well, it was Hunter Biden yet again, who's saying that he kicked ten percent of his paycheck up to the big guy. And it, he, he was caught red-handed in the Hunter Biden laptop emails saying that his client was the spy chief of China. And he had he, you know, created this company that was partnered with CEFC China Energy, one of the biggest Chinese energy firms. He was even pitching Chinese investors on buying up U.S. liquefied natural gas ports at the same time that, uh, the, Bi that the Biden world blob was negotiating these these favorable diplomacy terms with China and allowing China to evade sanctions with respect to exports in the Middle East. So then, the, and then the third one was Hunter Biden actually owns ten percent of a company called E Plata, which is a micro um, a micro financing loan company for illegal immigrants coming up through the southern border. And so, you know, at the same time, the Biden administration Justice Department put out a notice. Telling the banks that they that the Justice Department would take legal issue legal uh, action against any bank who who you know refused loans to illegal immigrants. Meanwhile, you know the first son 
is, uh, is, has an equity investment in a company that profits off those very loans. So you know, the, these are all you know, highly niche investments that you only know they're going to be profitable if you've got the big bad blob on your side to secure and protect them. But if you know, if you know that that jackpot is going to hit, you cash in big. It's it's so crazy for the average citizen to hear this. I, I it's it's scandalous. It's unsavory. It's unethical. But is it illegal? And is it something they're all engaged in? That that's sort of the thing. And then what do we do about it? Yeah. Well, well part of the issue is is Trump really bucked that trend which had existed for. Well, why didn't years. he talk about it? Why was he explicit about it? Why did he just use words like the swamp? Why didn't he send somebody out to educate about what you're exactly what you're talking about? Why didn't he, why didn't he send you out? Well, it's very hard because tr you know Trump inherited a civil war within his own party. Uh, when 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 Trump won the election, he didn't just defeat the Clinton dynasty in 2016. He defeated the Bush dynasty. Well, guess who were the only people you know on his side nominally within the within the Pentagon, within the CIA, within the State Department? They're Bush people. You know, they're whether it's it's Bush Cheney, it's the entire you know it's the entire wing that he defeated, and not just defeated, but actually disgraced in a lot of ways. Uh, in doing so, and then you had immediately, remember, before Trump was even inaugurated, the FBI was investigating him, and, and very quickly, within the first you know, mm -hmm. two months of Trump taking office, Trump was under the sword of Damocles of a special prosecutor. Bob Mueller, the FBI director from 9-11, from was you know, revived from the dead like a sort of crypt keeper <laughs> figure who dogged Trump for the first two and a half years of his presidency. And because of that, that swung a lot of leverage to Trump critics within the Republican Party who could win mm. concessions from the Trump White House because he needed them to stave off an impeachment vote. Remember, many of those Republicans Crazy. actually did vote to impeach. It was a, it was a, remember, Trump was impeached in 2019 just on potentially holding up Ukraine aid to a foreign country. Mitt Romney, you know, who was the, mind Mitt Romney was the guy who ran for president he was he was the he was the nominee for the uh, for the RNC against Barack Obama in the 2012 Republican Party. He's a guy who commanded mm -hmm. an incredible amount of clout. He's also on the board of the International Republican Institute, which is the main Republican CIA cutout. The uh, John uh, John McCain was the former head of the the IRI that CIA cutout. Who was John McCain? The guy who represented the Republican Party running against Barack Obama, you know, in in 2008. So all of the major Power, pillars of power of the GOP belonged to the specific set that Trump alienated with the foreign policy that he ran on. So he was very limited in his ability to actually stretch out his arms and make change there because the very people who he ran on on reforming were the people he needed to save his own political life. And, and so many of the things we all look at, like, you know, the border and the cartels and these things, you all want, what is going on? Why do they allow this to happen? It makes you, what makes the average person like myself wonder, is that part of some weird, effed up, delicate balance out there that we all are not aware of that the blob is sort of maintaining that things would be worse if the blob didn't maintain these things? Or is it really just the blob for the blob's sake, you know, and these personal political interests. Let, let me let me do this. I have to take a little break. So let, you can answer that question when we get back. Then I want to get into Missouri versus Biden. I want to get into free speech. I want to get what happened with COVID. We got a lot to get into. So I hope people are as enraptured and interested in what you're telling us as I am. So we'll get right back to it. Uh, Mike Benz Cyber, B-E-N-Z Cybers, where you can follow him on X. We'll be right back after this. You could spend thousands of dollars and dozens of hours trying to look a few years younger, or you can skip all that and the hassle and go with what works, GenuCell Skin Care. GenuCell is the secret to better skin. Their products are made in the USA using a proprietary technology that combines a naturally effective base with non-GMO ingredients. In fact, you might have witnessed the astonishing effects of GenuCell during a recent unplanned moment of our show. When just a little GenuCell XV restored my skin within minutes right before your eyes. That is how fast these products work. I know I'm a snob about the products I use on my face. Everybody knows it. Every time I go to the dermatologist's office, they're just rows and rows of different creams. Retinols, vitamin C cream, under eye cream, night creams. Scrubs. 
And then when I get to the counter, they're overpriced. All kinds of products that you can all find at GenuCell.com. Susan and I love GenuCell so much, we've created our own bundle so you can try our favorite anti-wrinkle creams, correcting serums, under eye treatments. Say goodbye to those fine lines, forehead wrinkles, skin redness, even those dark under eye bags. Women and men of all skin types, GenuCell has got you covered. Order right now at GenuCell.com slash Drew to save 50%, actually over 50%, and you'll get a free luxury spa box plus free shipping. That is genucel.com slash Drew, G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash D-R-E-W. Susan has talked about how she has been struggling with thinning hair and using Provia. I'm so happy because Provia is helping me grow longer, stronger, and shinier hair, especially up on top. Thank you, Provia. A reminder that Provia uses a safe natural ingredient called Procapo. It effectively targets the three main causes of premature hair thinning and hair loss, scalp circulation, the delivery of nutrients, and healthy hair follicle anchoring to the scalp. Provia guarantees more hair on your head than in the shower or on your comb. And right now, new customers save over 50% plus free shipping on Provia's introductory package at proviahair.com slash Drew. Every package includes a full 60-day supply of Provia serum for daily use, plus the Provia Super Concentrate for faster, more noticeable results. And every order includes your choice of a free gift. Provia works, guaranteed, or 100% of your money back. Don't wait. Order now to save an extra 10% and get free shipping at proviahair.com slash Drew. Not Dr. Drew, just Drew. That is P-R-O-V-I-A-H-A-I-R dot com slash Drew. We all know the value of a good night's sleep. We feel better, look better, have more energy to spare. But you could be missing out on all of those benefits if you're sleeping on sheets that are too hot or too cold or just plain uncomfortable. I have the solution. Cozy Earth Bedding. Cozy Earth is the softest and most comfortable sheets, blankets, loungewear, and more. They use premium viscose from highly sustainable bamboo, and we sleep in them regularly. I wear their t-shirts. Susan wears their pajamas. Cozy Earth Bedding comes with a 100-night sleep trial, which means you have up to 100 nights to sleep on them, wash them, try them out. If you're not in love, just return them within 100 days for a full refund. Susan and I love them. In fact, we have Cozy Earth sheets on our bed right now, and they made a huge difference in our sleep. If you've never tried Cozy Earth, we have some awesome news. You can save up to 35% off Cozy Earth right now. But hurry, this offer will not last. Go to CozyEarth.com, enter my promo code DREW at checkout for up to 35% off on your first order. That is CozyEarth.com, promo code DREW, C-O-Z-Y-E-A-R-T-H, CozyEarth.com, code D-R-E-W. We are uh, getting a primer from Mike Benz. If you want more, please follow him, Mike Benz Cyber on X. He puts up videos regularly, and you'll sort of get up to speed with if you need to hear some of this material again. And so, Mike, before the break, I was saying, you know, sort of what can be done about this? And is this, you know, when you look at things that seem inexplicable, uh, inexplicable in our world, it makes somebody like me wonder, is this some sort of delicate balance that, is necessary and so for some reason i can't understand or is it just the blob for blob's sake and uh, political operators well, that's what makes it tricky you know you can there's certainly a very robust school of thought in international relations that the blob is necessary which is which is to say that you know you can't make anything in our society without um you know milton freeman did this you know, famous speech about a pencil. I don't know if you've ever seen this. He's, he was sort of a libertarian kind of economic theorist. And he held up a pencil once and said, look at this little pencil. You know, the, the, how do you think you make this? Well, you know, it doesn't just yeah. fall out of a tree. You know, the gum, you have to get it yeah. from these special set of trees in Guyana. And the graphite comes from sub-Saharan Africa. And it goes through this whole supply chain. Well, everything that we need to make an industrial society requires parts and and supply chains and raw raw materials from plots of dirt that are held by foreign governments. If we want oil and gas, the reason you can make an argument that we only had this robust middle class prosperity, the American miracle in the 20th century, because of the work of the blob, which is to say that we had we had five times cheaper gas than uh, than than Europe did. And part of this was because we had a CIA and a State Department and a DOD. Who would who would overthrow governments, or who would coerce, or who would shake down foreign governments who didn't give us the oil and gas? The same thing when it comes mm. to gold, or silver, or lithium, or cobalt, or or mm. sugar. You, I mean, this started in, in the 1800s when we declared the Monroe Doctrine in 1823 mm -hmm. as a sort of peace with Europe. We said, "You stay there, 
we'll stay and we'll stay here. That was our claim to South America. That was when we started the banana wars. And uh, and as before our big oil empire, we had a big sugar and big ag empire that that again was corporate stakeholders giving American cheap fruit and you know tons of food and choice and all at a discount price. But that was because we installed banana republics, you know, uh, under the under the you know firing arm of, of the Department of War protecting them, which is now called the Department of Defense. So you can make an argument that this blob is a is a necessary evil. But we never had a situation before 2016. Well, you can you can make an argument about a, a, a strange event that happened in 1962, but we never had a mm. we never we never really had a moment where the blob at least came out and confessed that it was necessary to deploy its own special set of skills to take out an American threat to democracy, an American present. You know, democracy, again, is that watchword that we use to topple foreign governments and to install a new system of government. We, we you know, they never came out and said that, you know, they argued that Bush was like Hitler. You know, they argued that, you know, all, all different presidents, you know, that, that Jimmy Carter was ineffective, yada, yada. They never said, oh, threat to democracy. We need to contemplate what we do in Eastern Europe in terms of orchestrating a kind of domestic color revolution. This is all what they were saying in 2019, 2020. And it was the same, not just the same playbook, but it was the same players from those same institutions. And so, you know, the issue is, is we, we've had this pit bull outside the house to be able to protect American welfare, American, you know, security, American economic prosperity. But we are now living in the world where, you know, the pit bull has come inside the house and is essentially mauling anyone uh, anyone who tries to do what the pit bull doesn't doesn't want it makes you wonder who's really in charge of the house at this point well that sort of gets us into the free speech conversation and I in I, you know a lot of the stuff we discuss on this show is related to covid obviously for obvious reasons is did covid accelerate all this is it what exposed it or is was that more of just the same well the role of the blob in covid is really fascinating because you had you know every aspect top to bottom of of covid administration and response was mediated by the foreign policy establishment you know that you could you people are are obviously very familiar with the role of hhs and cdc and NIAID, but the fact is is 65% of warp speed funds were administrated by the pentagon the uh, you know the the strange situation involving uh, whoever had the miracle foresight to know that a coronavirus might be coming out soon in October 2019 when the Event 201 simulation took place. I mean, that was not just a obscure little group of scientists who were running that. The Event 201 simulation starred Avril Haines, who was the deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency under Barack Obama and is currently the director of national intelligence under Joe Biden. That is, she is the boss of bosses over the CIA. Now, what she was doing at a coronavirus breakout simulator three months before the, the virus broke out, uh, sitting right next to the head of Chinese intelligence while she was doing so, and specifically activating in the Event 201 segment with how to control the spread of misinformation, including about uh, conspiracy theories about the origins of the virus for people who said that it was a lab leak. This is all stuff that came, it was an Event 201. What the heck was the deputy director of the CIA doing articulating exactly what would go on to be what played out and what the, the government's response to that was? And, and then it gets stranger when you enter the censorship story. And by the way, you should also note other aspects of, of even the development of and the connection links between D.C. and, and China uh, are, are present in this as well. You know, there was a $54 million USAID grant. Uh, for the gain of function at, at Wuhan, USAID is one of the most notorious CIA uh, funding conduits. That is, when the CIA wants to fund an operation, uh, they don't just deposit funds in a bank uh, under you know beneficial ownership of the Central Intelligence Agency. It's done through 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 State Department uh, funds that are labeled under either USAID or National Endowment for Democracy or others. So, so you have this strange situation where CIA adjacencies were the ones funding this. And then the censorship story makes it really kind of chilling in a certain sense. All of the first major censorship institutions to censor COVID-19 narratives online came from either the Pentagon or the Central Intelligence Agency in terms of what their pedigree was. You know, the very first 
gargoyle to descend on social media to, to map emerging narratives about, about coronavirus was, was a group called Graphica. Graphica is, is a group that's gotten $7 million in Pentagon grants. They initially did uh, social media narrative mapping for the Pentagon so that when the Pentagon and CIA went into conflict zones, they could see what their opposition was saying online. They, they, uh, they were incubated within something called the Minerva Initiative, which was the Pentagon's Psychological Operations Research Center. So you had a formal Pentagon psychological operations firm uh, funded by the Pentagon, who in January 2020, with, with, and reaching back starting with December 16th, 2019, just four days after the outbreak, uh, go full scale into mapping all conspiracy theories about the virus, uh, as uh, mapping you know lab leak narratives, uh, mapping narratives that were that were pre skeptical of vaccine rollouts. They did this for all of the NATO countries. They created a network map of what people were saying online in the U.S., in Canada, in the U.K., in Italy, in Spain, in Greece. They went all through NATO. They said, here are the major influencers. Here's what they're saying. Here's the reach. They did a four month study between December 2019 and, and April 2020, mapping this all out. And they are a Pentagon psychological operations firm. Same thing with the Virality Project, which was this group of, of four uh, top censorship institutions. Every single one of them comes from the blob. These include the Stanford Internet Observatory, which who, the boss there is Michael McFall, who is the U.S. ambassador to Russia. Uh, it's you, The technical director there was Rene DiResta, who started her career in the CIA. The University of Washington, which is the Bill Gates University that works very closely uh, with, with, the, with the military through the, the Puget Sound military bases there. The Atlanta Council was, was the third one. The Atlanta Council has seven CIA directors on its board and gets annual funding for the Pentagon, the State Department, and, and the CIA cutouts like the National Endowment for Democracy. And the fourth one was, was Grafka. So all four of them are part of this you know, CIA, Pentagon, State Department blob apparatus, and they were the ones who were censoring tens of millions of posts about COVID, including pre-censoring events that hadn't even happened yet. Uh, Caleb very quickly put the graphica, graphics, ironically, up uh, next to you there. If you can see that, it's kind of extraordinary. Uh, uh, this is all, uh, you've made a lot of the Atlantic Council. Uh, are, are they Were they a major player in all this? And again, it's so, when you try to make sense of it, you, you look for motivation and it's hard to find it. I, I always get worried that one of the things I'm missing is uh, something about the viral research or the virus's potential that they're just not telling us. You know, wh why react so powerfully to this virus that had, you know, 3% fatality rate or 1.5% and 0% in young people, essentially, uh, w w except that there was some concern about it having more that they knew something that we didn't know, but turned out not to have happened or something, or they were, were they worried about that in some way? Well, this is where it starts to get, you know, speculative on my end. I, uh, you know, it's very clear what the motivations are, for example, with the blob censorship of the 2020 election. Uh, and, and essentially, and, and, you know, I, I'm not saying this in a partisan way, but you can see why, for example, the blob would be motivated to stop the rise of someone like Trump. You, even the, the Biden World Foreign Policy Establishment, those three personal, you know, foreign policy for personal profit schemes that the Biden family was involved in, all three of those are jeopardized by a Trump presidency, right? I mean, the Ukraine mm -hmm. one, you know, if, if we can't, if, if NATO doesn't retake the Eastern region, Burisma doesn't get access to that shale. If we close off the border, the E Plata, you know, platform basically disintegrates with the microloans. If we do maximum pressure on China, the CEFC energy deals fall away. So there's all sorts of commercial interests. Uh, at the political censorship level. You know, when it comes to COVID, I have some deep, dark speculations about it, but it, it, I'd feel a little over my skis putting them, putting them out verbally. Because oh, let's I, do it. Come on. <laughs> let's let's put, put one of them out there. Look, I just speculated about the possibility of the virus having some c capacity, you know, innate capacity for mutation or maybe some neurological effects that we haven't yet seen. or, or some, You know, I, I worry about that kind of stuff because their behavior is so inexplicable in relation to the virus and the way we, the world, not just, you know, California, the world reacted to it. And uh, maybe it is just social media and with this new environment in which information spreads uncontrollably. But I worry about other things, and I'm sure you do too. Well, there's, there's so many that, that are involved in, in the COVID situation, which, which almost, because there's so many, it sort of explains why there was so, there was so much stakeholder 
you know, um, <laughs> so many, so many stakeholder best. meetings around administrating it, you know, from the World Economic mm -hmm. Forum, who essentially is the sort of global version of the Chamber of Commerce, you know, all the way into, uh, you know, all the way into the political classes. I mean, one of the points that I just made on, on X the other day is, you know, the, the pandemic is over, but we still have universal mass mail-in voting. You know, we only have mm -hmm. universal mass mail-in voting because COVID. You know, that, that was mm -hmm. something that, uh, you know, we'd, you can go back and look at the Civil War. In 1864 or 1862, there was, uh, you know, there were scandals around the use of mail-in ballots. The idea of doing universal mass mail-in ballots as all, combined with no ID checks is something that you really need a kind of COVID-like crisis to induce. You know, you do have the strange situation of seven states flipping overnight and, and this strange foreknowledge of the Red Mirage blue ship. So, you know, there's, there's weird political unresolved mysteries around the utility of COVID and being able to pull that off. There's, there's the very strange issues around vaccine diplomacy that I find fascinating, but I, I try not to talk about too much because I'm not a subject matter expert in vaccines. I, I try to stick to the censorship industry intrigues around this. But what, what, is, what is the vaccine diplomacy? What does that mean? I mean, giving people the vaccine for a certain, you know, gains or well, what? Well, we, we have the U.S. military has a counterinsurgency doctrine to be able to quell the rise of political movements around the world who challenge U.S. backed installed U.S. installed dictators. So like a classic example of this is in Iraq and Afghanistan. So in Afghanistan, uh, we, you know, the, the, we obviously invaded in the early 2000s. We took out the Taliban. We installed uh, basically a narcotics warlord, uh, Hamid Karzai, you know, ruled with an iron fist. The, uh, the civilian class within, within Afghanistan was, uh, was aghast at, at Karzai's rule. Uh, there, was a, there were, there were in political insurgency movements who were constantly rising in Afghanistan to try to unseat him. And uh, the you know in response, David Petraeus put out this uh, put out this new military doctrine around the need for biometrics to control the rise of of uh, dissident political movements in places where the, the military thought uh, it was too fragile to be able to contain in a classical counterinsurgency way. And, and the utility of biometrics and and biometric you know collection was that you would be able to have a real time heat map of people. They, they had a big problem with crowds. And the fact that people would go, you know, they'd have these big demonstrations or they'd march on a town and the Pentagon and the CIA would know who, you know, two or three of the key leaders are, or maybe a dozen of their lieutenants. But then there'd be a hundred thousand people that you don't know who they are. You don't know if they're for you or um, you're not going to be able to pinpoint them and identify them as the bad guys that you need to take out. But if you have all of their biometrics and one picture of the, you know, w you know, one picture of the of the crowd can basically identify everybody, or if you've got their if you've got their health information, you're able to basically create this this heat map of the population. There was a there was a whole new field within the military called identity intelligence, and they had this plan around ID twenty twenty, which involved the which involved trying to get up to an eighty five percent threshold of the collected biometrics of all of the civilian populations where the DoD was trying to strike down uh, political insurgency movements. Now, one of the cutouts that they used to do this were vaccine clinics. There was a big, there was a big scandal in Pakistan, I believe, in 2013, where that where a CI, where a vaccine clinic was busted as a CIA front for collecting the biometric data on, uh, you know, on, on the people in Pakistan. Pakistan has this very tight relationship with the U.S. intelligence community. This is how we funded the Mujahideen to unseat the Soviets in Afghanistan in the 1970s. Uh, the CIA and the Pakistani ISI are basically tied at the hip, and so you know th that was that was one instance. But you know, when when you look at the State Department's vaccine diplomacy initiatives around the world, it's it's a way of when there is a crisis in, in that's either induced or that is shall shall we say uh, naturally emergent within a region. This gives a predicate for a sort of biosecurity entry by the Pentagon and by extension the sort of political class from NATO to descend on a region and control its internal politics because we get a toehold through humanitarian relief efforts. You know, there was a great example a couple of years ago where USAID was busted uh, running a, a, uh, an HIV uh, uh, re uh, response clinic in Cuba, but secretly, uh, secretly funneling teams of, of armed militants into this HIV prevention clinic because uh, no one would think that a simple little public health response center 
would be the means through which we might get a military toehold over Cuba. You can make an argument that something very similar happened in sub-Saharan Africa in the 1990s and 2000s, as well as throughout uh, <laughs> throughout Central Asia and Latin America. I, I, there's, there's, there's a lot there that I find personally very concerning, but the military's role in that, that the power of, uh, of, of epidemic response as being a predicate to be able to get a toehold in a region that you are boxed out of under normal political uh, circumstances is, uh, is something that I find very troubling. There were lots of these Pentagon um, presentations, actually, in the 1990s and 2000s about how um, about the three things emerging from the conflict zones that the Pentagon wanted to operate in being paramilitaries, um, uh, narcotics, and pandemics. And you know, essentially, all three of those give a predicate to put military boots on the ground in the region. That is, if there is a terrorist group there, then we get to put our toehold there. And then once we have our toehold, they can never kick us out. Um, you know, narcotics right. is another one of these. And the third one is, is pandemic response. And so, you know, there, there's, there's a, between the commercial, the political and the military stakeholders in, in COVID, um, you know, there's, there's a lot there. Yeah, I, I get that. Is there a Mike Benz on the other side of the aisle? Does, does the Biden administration have a Mike Benz and how would he see these things or her? Well, I think I can make the opposing argument, you know, very very fluently. I mean, I, I I think that I'm as conversant in these things as I am because I I study the versions of me on the other side of it. You know, a great example of this is I talk about the need for a whole of society, you know, free free speech coalition. That's not my term. That's the term that the people on the other side of me came up with uh, for forming a whole of society, joint government, private sector, civil society, media coalition. On that side, you know, I I. I mean, I articulated at the start of this segment the the reasons that the blob, even though I'm a sort of anti-blob crusader in many respects, uh, I can, if you put me on the other side of the debate table, I could very strongly make the moral case for the blob having the powers that it does and doing certain the th things that it does. I understand some of their motivations. You know, at the time, even with, with respect to the Trump election in 2016, they were making the argument that the entire rules-based international order would collapse unless free speech was censored right. on social media. Because at the time right. Brexit had happened, they were afraid of Frexit in France with Marine Le Pen, it'll exit in Italy with Matteo Salvini, Spexit in Spain with the Vox Party, uh, Grexit in, in Germany with the AFD Party, Grexit in, in, in Greece. The entire EU would come undone, which would mean NATO would come undone, which would mean there's no enforcement for the creditor class in Wall Street or London or the IMF or the World Bank. And in a certain sense, they're not entirely wrong in, in that, in that mm. yes, social media popularity of, of President Trump, yes, social media popularity of Nigel Farage and the Brexit movement, of Marine Le Pen in France, yes, probably would cause something akin to a seismic reformation of the, the thing that they call the rules-based international order because of free speech on the internet. You know, what we learned from, uh, from the social media revolution was that the, that consensus uh, on the, in the foreign policy establishment that it existed from Truman to Trump was not so much a, a, you know, a, a factor of people making up their own independent hearts and minds, but, but as, as a controlled media ecosystem putting bumper cars on democracy and, and what people could vote on. And when people had their own free will to choose, they might not go along with what the New York Times says. They might make their own media channels. And so there's, there's so much, right. you know, that's there's so happening. much there. Right. And that, that's kind of, that's happening now. And now that gets us to Missouri versus Biden. Why is that the most important free speech case of, in the U.S. history? You, you, yeah, built, is, you built to this. Right. Yes. Well, well, this is the grand stage for it all. And I, we should note that, this Supreme Court oral argument from Monday, and that's playing out over the next several weeks and months here, is, is still on a is still a, a SCOTUS ruling on a preliminary judgment, which is to say that there's going to be years of discovery in this case, no matter what the Supreme Court says uh, in terms of its sort of placeholder ruling. So, you know, mm -hmm. this is a very important next few weeks, but you know, it remains to be seen what the final judgment will be after all of the discovery pours in that that the plaintiffs are entitled to. But the reason this is the most important free speech case in American history is because this is the really the first case that puts the existence of the First Amendment on trial. And we've had all these edge cases. You know, there's the famous Brandenburg, you know, case from the 1970s around, 
you know, where do we draw the line about whether or not, you know, uh, you know, whether something, you know, whether shouting fire in a crowded, you know, right. Right. Crowded theaters, you know, th- these sort of edge cases about when something is harm versus when it's sort of ordinary course. But we've never had a permanent, politically uh, codified censorship, off- domestic censorship office within the U.S. government until just a few short years ago. You know, DHS, mm-hmm. for example, created a, a formal censorship subagency called CISA. Which, which you know, literally, <laughs> literally, you know, argued that social, that domestic First Amendment protected speech by U.S. citizens about their own internal affairs, ranging from elections, ranging from COVID, ranging from energy or climate or border or even the Ukraine war, could all be censored by the U.S. government uh, under the idea that critical infrastructure is, um, you know, is something DHS is uh, is mandated to protect and there's this is a cyber agency so it's protecting cyber infrastructure uh, and this and critical we have critical infrastructure our elections are critical infrastructure public health response is critical infrastructure you know um border security is is critical infrastructure you can make this argument about every sensitive policy issue in the world as they did to say that because of that well then that's you know that's a cyber attack on critical infrastructure if your tweet undermines public faith and confidence in it so if the Supreme Court does not strike down that arrangement as being violative of the First Amendment, then we don't have a First Amendment. I mean, this is absolutely existential. If a government office can coordinate the censorship of domestic speech, then the government is in control of domestic speech. There's no two ways yeah. about that. Now, now, but the, there, there are gradations of victory here, which is where it starts to get a little bit more interesting in the sense that I, I expect free, the, the freedom side to win it, uh, on this issue at least partially or in large part, but we really need a slam dunk home run to send a message in order for this thing, this apparatus to be significantly, dent, significantly dented because there's so many ways of creative structuring to drive a Mack truck through the pinhole of, of a loophole. And I can get into what right. those are, but, it, but uh, you know, that's, that's why this case is so important. It, it's so interesting to me that uh, no one sort of brings up the aliens, or at least doesn't seem to come up much, the Aliens and Sedition Act, which I had always thought was a sor- source of great disgrace that we ever let that happen and that we must never do that, anything like that again. And yet this feels exactly like that. Like you said, you point at things that we have to do uh, as, uh, you know, sort of critical, critical uh, issues for the government, and then that's the, that. Wasn't that the Aliens and Sedition Act? Wasn't that what they did? Yeah, it, it may have been. I'm, I'm not as familiar on that in, on that in particular. But you know what you have right now is the Biden administration formally, legally arguing before the Supreme Court that uh, that the First Amendment no no longer classically applies because it didn't contemplate social media. You know, they're basically making well, the and, argument, and about, you have a. Yeah, and you have a, a, a Supreme Court justice who sounded sort of sympathetic to that uh, point of view in terms of the potential uh, contagion of social media. Right. Well, this is now, uh, this is now a, a position that is being articulated at the highest levels of our national security state. General Michael V. Hayden says the same thing, former head of the CIA, NSA, and four-star general. Um, you know, there's, there's dust, Rick Stengel, you know, who's the, as I mentioned, was the guy who set up the global engagement center at the state department, the first, you know, censorship office who formerly said that his job was to export the first amendment because it was so important and unique and then loses one yeah. election and suddenly calls for an end to it. Um, you know, this is, this is what these, you know, top of the, of the, you know, apex predator of the national security state figures are saying, and that is because they are being outvoted by the civilian class. And so this is why the point I made on Tucker is, is what, what we're confronted by right now is essentially a form of military rule. If you can have the blob, the foreign policy establishment, you know, the, the defense diplomacy and intelligence world combined with its corporate and financial stakeholders, be able to, can, be able to censor the ability for civilians to reform them. Then the civilians, that everything that we were ever told about the legitimacy of democracy is now collapsed instantaneously. You know, democracy draws its legitimacy from the idea that government is not an overclass. It serves the people, and you know that it serves the people because their hearts and minds have ratified it 
in the form of a democratic vote. That it is not, it is not a government overclass. It is a government underclass. It serves the people because the people want it. Well, if you can't even allow the people to express what they want because that overclass has, you know, has, has censored or pre-censored them, then you don't have civilian rule anymore. You don't have civilian rule over your own media. You don't have civilian rule over your own elections. You don't have civilian rule over your own government. You know, it, it's uh, and now this may have been the structure that we've had in this country for a century, as we as we've described. But they've never had to reveal themselves in this way or break out the you know formal censorship institutions. You know that they the government is currently. The current reigning philosophy within the censorship industry is something, a framework called the whole of society framework, which is a, which is a formal, you know, a formal four part alliance between the government, civil society, the private sector and the media. That is, that is a formal censorship mm. quarterback position for the government to determine the, the activities of the private sector, the NGOs, the universities, the nonprofits, the media companies and the fact checking groups. So if, if that's not stopped, we are diplomatically indistinguishable from North Korea or China or any other autocratic country that we sanction for doing exactly what we're doing now. Well, you've been very generous with your time, and I think that's a very good place to kind of roll to a stop. I mean, that's uh, sort of an extraordinary statement. I hope I hope it landed. I hope people are listening to what you said. I, I would love to bring you back to talk about those pinholes through which a Mack truck can be driven. And it might even be more interesting as the Missouri versus Biden case goes along and you can help us understand what, what is what is at issue there. Uh, Caleb, I wanted to give you a chance to ask Mike some questions. I, he, he, you were very busy flashing on. You've been, I've seen you very busy on the internet and sharing what you've been finding uh, on the screen. Uh, I'm sure you have a couple of questions of your own. Oh, I've, I've been way too distracted to even get my <laughs> questions here. Yeah, pulling up stuff on the screen. Okay. It's a... Uh, yeah, no, okay. this is all very interesting to me. I, I actually do have a question. Uh, when did you first start noticing, you, you might have mentioned this earlier and I missed it, but when did you first start noticing the influence of foreign operations on places like Facebook uh, back before the election? Did you notice that this started coming from places like China or were they more like places like Turkey or was this from Russia? Or was it U.S.? Or USA <laughs> trying to influence US? everyone? Because it, it really <laughs> seemed like to me like it was US. a very odd rise of... <laughs> Facebook groups of people that would just start Republicans versus Democrats that they didn't seem like they were real people fighting. They were just trying to fake fights against each other on Facebook to try and get more engagement right around the time of the election, about probably, what, five or eight years ago. And then that all disappeared very quickly when Facebook cracked down on it. Do you know where that was coming from? Was that China? Was that here? Or was that Turkey? I don't believe that at all, actually. Uh, everything that I've investigated around that has shown that to be basically either hollow or completely impotent and ineffective and used purely as a predicate for the CIA to put its claws into the social media companies in order to stop the foreign policy agenda of a candidate that they hated, you know, with all their guts. So, you know, what, what you're describing right there is sort of the argument that was made by the Justice Department about the Russian Internet Research Agency before the Justice Department dropped all of its cases against them when two of the defendants demanded discovery. And they said, we can't tell you how we actually know that because it would undermine U.S. national mm -hmm. security. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, this was this was something that, you know, even the CIA made these big, bold proclamations about all the evidence they had about Russian interference uh, in that January 2017 memo. But all I, I read that memo the day it came out. There was nothing in it. It was completely unsupported. All they had was an appendix at the end saying that Russia Today and Sputnik, the you know respectively the TV and and radio, you know uh, basically the, you know Russia's version of the BBC uh, had uh, had you know skyrocketed in popularity relative to other state-run media institutions like like uh, PBS or or the BBC, and and those were totally above you know those were public-facing institutions. These were not you know you can say what you want about RT being pro Russia propaganda. It certainly is. But it, it's not some big clandestine operation. They they had a formal, you know, they were they were an account like any others. Even the total amount of spend that they attributed to the IRA was a hundred thousand dollars. A hundred thousand dollars. That's one U.S. middle class salary. Hillary Clinton spent one point three billion dollars on her campaign. And by the way, they even said that that uh, that hundred thousand dollars was split between pro Trump and anti Trump groups. You know, these were there's knowing these people and the, all of the hoaxes they perpetrated. Just, that, that could have been a U.S. citizen using a VPN. Many of these VPNs right. are you right. know, warp in from foreign countries. Warp in from you know, Russia is a very popular VPN address. 
you know, for, for, from everything from, you know, uh, you know, NordVPN to a dozen of others. You can actually pick when you go to a VPN what country you want your IP address to be able to warp in from. You know, and many of these have been totally busted. There was a, you know, who wrote the, the Senate intelligence report on Russian interference? It was a firm called New Knowledge LLC. They wrote that in 2018. You know what ha- came out in 2019? New Knowledge itself had personally yeah. purchased Russian bot farms, 23,000 fake Russian accounts to mass subscribe them to Roy Moore's Senate, uh, you know, Re- Republican Senate runoff uh, in, in November 2017. They, so the people whining about ro- fake Russian bots and making the formal pro- pro- proclamations of the Senate Intelligence Committee, the oversight for the CIA, they were the ones creating the fake Russian bots. So none of these people have any credibility. You know, they, they've done... They've called people Russian bots, and those people have had to go on Sky News in the UK and say, hey, I'm actually, you can go on my on my Twitter page right now and look up a guy named Ian456, you know, who, I mean, this, there's, there are hundreds of examples of these people being flat busted. They have zero credibility. Right. And they're paid by the state. These people all come from the CIA or the State Department. Their job yeah. is to is to rig elections around the world, and they did it here. You know, something that, that inter- I, I think I think is eventually going to be a part of the story are, are that a lot of these were actually run by individuals who saw a gold mine in creating fake news websites before those really got shut down by changes in the algorithm and changes on Facebook. There was a gold rush. And I remember because I used to I never ran any of these, but I remember people in my circles of that ran websites and started launching these campaigns. You could put up fake news and it would go everywhere and you would get tons of ad views and they would make lots of money off of it. None of those people are going to come out now and say, oh, I did this. This is how I made a million dollars back well, in you know, 2019, 2020. But there was but a I'll tell you industry. What, they could manipulate Facebook quite easily. It, it, what's very- interesting to me is that, is that the, the hoax and the, these, this sort of this phenomenon is sort of known to people now and they're, they're mocking it and making fun of it and not falling victim to it so much. So their ability to do these things has shifted, uh, which I would call progress. <laughs> I would say that we're we're all seeing it. And same thing with the with the tr- mainstream media. They pick up on this BS and they start reporting it as though it's factual. They they just they just further erode their audience and their legitimacy. Well, and I would say that's a good thing because they're showing themselves not to be trustworthy. So I'm seeing this pattern again right now with the whole fake news industry, where it's not even. I mean, some of it is. It looks like it's government propaganda run, but it's actually a lot of people, especially on X right now, because you have this gold rush of monetization. These are Mm. AI run bots that spread all of these fake stories and this fake news across to everyone. And they're just trying to incite people because the more you can incite people on X, the more replies you get, the more page views you get, the more money that you make. Can you name a few of those AI bot accounts? I mean those, but there's also real people that are running them that they do you, specifically. Do you have you them? Look, do you have the names? I'll, I'll see if I can find them because there's actually one I just saw two minutes ago that replied to you, Drew, and it looks like a real person for like ten seconds. Then you dig into it, and it's like this is they're they're responding to look like humans. They're using AI text generation with a verified account to make themselves look real mm. to drive up engagement. That's the whole is the it, whole point. Is, is it the one that responded to me, or I responded? I responded to her. Uh, or it's, him. it's one that responded to you. They're getting more and more realistic, but it's it's a it's a money making scheme. It's there's well, groups get, of get people Mike behind those this names. That, huh? yeah, I want I'll him looking you. at those things for yeah. sure. But Mike, you were trying <laughs> to answer both me and Caleb, and you've been very kind with your time. I want to give you a chance to respond to what we just said. People have don't underestimate people's immune system to these type of things. You know, in the 1990s, it was very popular that Nigerian princes would ask you for money over email. You know, and those the, that you know this still happens to this day, but now it's sort of a meme. You know, if you get a uh, you know if you get a request for money over email by uh, someone who claims to be part of the aristocracy of a sub-Saharan African con- you know continent country, um, it's probably a scam. You remember banner ads from the late '90s, you know, early 2000s. This is these were these highly visible, clickbaity type things that uh, a lot of people would click on because it was very new to them. They hadn't developed the immune system for it. I would not underestimate, you know, and this is, I think, was the point that, that that you were making earlier is that you know people acclimate to these these tricks over time, and you know, yeah. as, as a general matter, you know, credibility is something that is earned over time, and people. Even yeah. though there will always be a sort of sensation. I mean, remember, mass mainstream journalism in this country really started with yellow journalism. It started with yes. fake, yes, fake news. And, you know, the, yep. uh, you know, that's, I mean, that, right. that's, that's right. That, that's always going to be with us. You know, there, there's the question is well, when you put the US government 
in charge of the of determining what that is, then you know, then there's no citizen opposition that's possible because they're going to call you fake news. And we saw yeah. this happen in COVID. We saw it happen in the 2020 election. We saw it happen in the early response, you know, to the breakout of war, you know, in uh, with with Russia and Ukraine. We saw we saw it happen in the immigration debate. You know, this is this is a power, a godlike power that you never want the government to have because there's no getting yeah. it back from that. Uh, but example. one thing, nor the media. I mean, nor the media. I mean, back in the days of the Lincoln Douglas debate, uh, Lincoln would go back and read the transcripts of the two different papers and bring them together because he said they were like listening to two different debates, the left and the right, and that all coalesced with the Hearst group. And uh, you could, uh, there's evidence. I mean, I believe it to be true that he he caused the Spanish American War. He single handedly precipitated that war. Yes, yes, Rosebud. Uh, that's the, that's the uh, yeah. old, you know, Citizen, <laughs> Citizen Kane story. And, you know, the, the Spanish-American War is where the American empire started. That's how we became that's an right. international that's right. global empire. We won the Philippines. And, the, and that's how we, we basically built up our navy around that. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, this was, this was coming on the heels of the, you know, the, uh, the, the War Department's early relationship with mass mainstream media. You know, this... And, this whole game, you know, United Fruit was one of the four consortium companies of the uh, of the mm -hmm. the National Broadcast uh, Association or whatever you know the, that first mm -hmm. conglomeration of, of mass mainstream media, which got rolled into the Pentagon's Office of War Information. All of our you know ABC, NBC, and CBS, the three the big three new TV news stations of the 20th century, you know all were started by former veterans of, of the Pentagon's Office of War Information. There'd always been this relationship between mass mainstream media and the Pentagon. You know, in, in t except these ten essentially golden years of internet freedom from 2006 to 2016, we're living in the era of them reasserting that control over media that they had in the 20th century. And the question is, is you know, can we can we successfully take that on? And and I know sometimes when I do these presentations, a lot of people get depressed. And I I, you know, I you do, should, you should, but take heart, okay. I mean, I'll just tell you, as a veteran of this war for, for eight long years, the first six years of this were absolutely miserable because nobody would even believe it was mm -hmm. happening. I could show clips of all these people confessing it. I could do a seven-hour supercut, and it wouldn't be enough. The wins that we have had in the past 12 months are absolutely extraordinary and, and something that, that we should be extremely proud of and and you're working to to build momentum on. I'll give you one example. Just recently, there was a there was a hit piece on me in the New York Times on Monday of this week. I I was mentioned mm -hmm. by name 20, 24 times. Me and Elon Musk and uh, and Stephen Miller, who's who's got a, a group that's suing a lot of these censorship organizations, and and you know they just the article was a hit piece on us because it said that we were winning successfully. On, on all fronts, we were winning uh, legally. We were winning in terms of the legislature. We were winning in terms of getting DHS to claim that it wouldn't do it anymore. We were winning in terms mm. of getting agencies defunded. We were we were winning the, the media PR battle. And so, you know, and, and I've watched as all these things, you know, have, have played out. You know, in September 2022, the Harvard Misinformation Review published a piece calling disinformation studies within academia too big to fail, arguing that oh. censorship's that the field of censorship was now basically akin to the Lehman, you know, like a like like the Lehman Brothers 2008 situation, or or like a, you know J.P. Morgan. It couldn't collapse because cens the censorship industry is too deeply embedded within the federal government. One year mm -hmm. later, to the date, September 2023, after after all the the work that we've been doing on this, the Washington Post put out a piece citing the Stanford Internet, uh, uh, citing the Harvard Misinformation Review, saying that the field of disinformation studies is now crumbling in disarray because of of everything that all, the the big counter pushback. So, this is always going to be an ebb and flow. There's going to be an evolutionary arms race of the citizens against the blob for the next seventy years. There's no putting the genie back in the bottle, but we've shown that this thing is not immortal. It can be dented. You can take it on. It is going to, you know, they raise the stakes by arresting people now and doing things with the Justice Department that we yeah. couldn't have contemplated a couple of years ago. But, yeah. you know, take some sure. heart. We are, in many ways, we are, we are winning in a way now that we did not for the first six years of this fight. We will leave it there, Mike. Again, I want to bring you back to talk about the, uh, the more about Missouri versus Biden and the so-called pinholes that people could drive through if we're not careful and see how if those things do show up uh, on some of the Supreme Court opinions. Uh, any, any place else you'd like people to go? When is the book coming out? Tell me more. Yeah. 
So, you know, the book is probably going to be a, a late 2025 thing. You know, it's something I'm, I'm, I'm eight, eight years pregnant with, so to speak. So it'll probably, <laughs> probably be next one. But um, the best place to follow me is on X, you know, slash Twitter at Mike Ben Cyber. I post like 30 times a day, and including the stuff from, from my foundation's uh, investigative research. And that's foundationforfreedomonline.com. Mike, thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Thank you. See you soon. You got it. So, so interesting. There it is up there in big letters. Uh, Director of Foundation for Freedom Online. And uh, let's look at the schedule coming up. We have a very interesting guest. And today was, of course, no exception to that. Um, we have Kelly Fond Fontania. I think I should pronounce her name. Um, Look her up on X, and you'll 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 see why I'm putting her on the show. We got Greg Lukianoff coming in here next week. Peter McCullough with Steph Coulson, Drea DeMatteo, G Van Fleet, Ed Dow with Kelly Victory coming on April third. So there's a lot of very interesting people yet ahead. And uh, again, as always, at contact at drdrew.com, we will be taking your suggestions. If you have anybody there, follow us on at Ask Dr. Drew for upcoming shows and guests. And uh, again, thank you for supporting the people that support us. We are enthusiastic about the people that we partner with to create this show. And we are enthusiastic about you guys, about the audience, and, and what a great audience we've, we've uh, sort of assembled over this debacle that we call COVID. And uh, I mean, think about the, the ground we've traveled. traveled. Mike Benz at the end there did give me a little bit of pause for uh, optimism. Uh, it, it feels overwhelming and, and wild when you hear about these things the first time, but it... It, it's it, it, the whole, I, like I said, all throughout COVID, I was like shaking my head, like, what is going on here? What is happening? This doesn't make sense, but it is starting to make sense. And we'll continue to make sense of these things. We'll continue to push back. Uh, please join us again tomorrow. I think we're early, Caleb. Is that correct? Or is yes, that on I believe it's Thursday? At, uh, two, uh, tomorrow's show is at uh, 12 p.m. Noon. noon Pacific. I see noon, yes. yeah. And we're most so likely we'll going to be talking you... about the uh, TikTok stuff and the Trojan horse behind those, the and uh, I think Neil Brennan's coming in at the end of tomorrow's show as well. And uh, we'll see you then noon tomorrow. Be there at 3 o'clock Eastern, 12 Pacific. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com slash help. The parallel economy has empowered us to care for our health, well-being, as well as longevity. Likewise, for us pet parents who now have a place to go when it comes to keeping the family dogs, cats, even horses in the best shape possible. As a dog dad, I'm thrilled to be working with Pet Club 24-7, a company founded by two guys who lost dogs to serious conditions, including cancer. Pet Club 24-7 has an incredible array of products, including a line of supplements for humans, such as the Inforce Plus Corollius Versicolor and Inforce Corollius Versicolor with Reishi. My friend and colleague, Christina Ferrari, a cancer survivor herself, swears by it. When I was diagnosed, the doctor in the emergency room told me, you have two years to live. Oh boy. Along with the stem cell, I took these. I have been in remission for eight years now. For dogs, mush puppy treats are a fan favorite. Rex, you want to, oh boy. <laughs> oh, he came right. Oh, there he is. <laughs> they are also made with the Coriolis Versicolor Mushroom, which supports their immune system according to hundreds of clinical studies. Here's Kristen Ludlow, National Vice President. That strain does matter. We do have the most potent strain and we also extract it in a proprietary way. And that's why we've been having such wonderful experiences with these products. Mush puppies are made here in the U.S. There are no fillers. It's not addicting. Your dog can't accidentally overdose. Go to drdrew.com slash pet club 24 seven for a discount off the list price. That is drdrew.com. P-E-T-C-L-U-B 247. Pet Club 247.